Let's just all take a moment to prepare ourselves to go before the Lord. To stand amazed in His presence. Lord Jesus, we are in awe of You.
how marvelous and how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Marvelous. often because it's true. By His death and resurrection on the cross, we are cleansed, pure, and white. Washed in the redemptive blood of Jesus. We celebrated it last week. And Lord Jesus, we thank You. So let's sing this story story that changed the world. Rumors of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior Holiness with
scripture here. Um, I can't play and read at the same time, so bear with me. I want to read from Romans 8, 38. It says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. His love is amazing. And uh, I, for the many, many, many years of my life, I've shared this before, I'll share it again. That uh, I spent most of my life looking for something to fill the hole in my heart. A love that no human could ever provide. And I filled it with all manner of things. I filled it with so many different things. And then I found Jesus. And some people would say that he found me, but he knew where I was all along. I found Jesus. And I bowed down before him. And I gave my life. That love, that hole in my heart was filled in that moment. Now, I'm not going to say that, that it's been perfect ever since because it hasn't. Uh, it's, been, uh, <laughs> it's been hard. But I've never once doubted Jesus' love for me. I've never once doubted his grace and his mercy. 
So let's just sing about that love. And uh, just cry out to him. I want these words that we're going to sing, let them paint a picture, a beautiful picture. God, you are so good. So good. Heart turns violently and 
Thank you again for uh, joining Grace Bible Church online. We uh, appreciate you tuning in. Um, if you want to be kept up to speed with everything that's going on in the life of the church, uh, the best way to do that is to text the code that you see there on the screen. And uh, that way, all the announcements will be sent to you on your phone each week, um, especially with Governor Abbott coming out with uh, the announcement, as well as uh, President Trump talking about kind of reopening things. Um, hopefully, we're going to be able to meet back here on campus, at least in some form in the future. And so uh, the best way to keep up to speed with that is uh, by having these announcements sent to your phone. And uh, of course, we'll continue to post everything on Facebook. But thank you again uh, for joining us today. Um, we are launching this new series uh, called The Shorts, and I took it after uh, the Oscar awards for uh, the award goes to the uh, short film uh, kind of category. And um, if you recall, what we're going to do uh, in this series is we're going to look at um, some of the short books of the Bible, and we're going to address um, one book per message, and uh, just kind of see what God has to say about that uh, in that particular book. Um, but I threw out this little contest. Um, we named uh, each message after a movie and wanted to see if you could guess which book that was. So for this week, the movie... Uh, title is A Series of Unfortunate Events. Um, many of you posted what you believed the short book of the Bible uh, that was, but we ended up with one winner. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ruth. So uh, Crystal Dirks, you are the uh, winner of this prize that you see here. We've got all kinds of stuff that you can uh, watch movies with at home. Uh, I'm sure you're probably doing a lot of that right now. Um, and we'll be reaching out to you a little bit later today and uh, kind of finding out what uh, gift card, $10 gift card, you would like to go into this uh, for, uh, whether that's Netflix gift card or um, uh, some iTunes movie kind of card, something like that. But we'll reach out to you and uh, we'll drop this gift off at your house. So uh, thanks for playing. We'll post uh, the next message, uh, movie title, so to speak, uh, in, the, uh, up this, in this upcoming week, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. So... As you have been uh, turning your books to the book of Ruth, here's a question that um, I want you to kind of ask yourself. Uh, what do you do when you have problems? What do you do when you have problems? And of course, we all have all kinds of problems. It's kind of like a common denominator in life. Uh, you know, you think about COVID-19 right now, uh, that alone is a problem. Of course, there's all kinds of sub-problems that come with that. Um, again, some of you have kind of struggled with uh, your job situation, being furloughed or uh, cut in pay or just your loss of job altogether. Some of you are struggling with uh, you know, not having school, uh, whether that's parents or kids. Um, there's all kinds of problems that we have just even in our current set of times. But the question is, is what do we do with our problems? So we're here in Ruth, and as we read through this chapter, um, I, want to, I want you to see how many problems are there in chapter one alone. So Ruth chapter one, and it says there in, uh, in verse one, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, which by the way, there's problem number one, there's a famine. It then says, a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons, which by the way is problem number two, because 
they're in a famine, and as a result, they're forced to move to a foreign land, a foreign country. They have no connections. They have no contacts whatsoever. And so they go there, and, and, and it's just kind of on a whim, on a, on a hope that, that life will be better there, but they're not sure. Verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malin and Kilian. They were Ephathrites, and, and I... There's a problem, number three, I can't even say that name. So, Fath, whatever. They were from Bethlehem in Judah. So, they went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. So, now we have problem number three. The patriarch of the family is, is dead. These, referring to the two sons, took Moabite wives. And the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. And then both Malin and Killian died, so that the woman or the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So now we've got problems four and problems five. Now, to truly see the depth of their problems, we've got to see their family tree. So, so here's their family tree. You've got Elimelech, who's married to Naomi. You've got Malin, who married Orpah, and Killian married Ruth. But as we just saw in the opening verses, all of the men, the patriarchs, the leaders of the family, they're all dead. Now you've got three women, all of whom are widows, none of whom have offspring. And in a male-dominated culture and society, women were incredibly vulnerable. Problem six. But we're not finished. Verse six. Then she, meaning Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So so they begin to pack their things to take this journey, and as they do so, Naomi gives her two daughters-in-laws essentially an out. They're not from the land of Israel, they're Moabites. And so she offers them, she says, if you want to stay here, then, then you can. And Orpah takes Naomi up on her offer, which then presents problem number seven because now Naomi and Ruth are on their own. But Ruth, she chooses to stay with Naomi. And it's at this point that uh, Ruth utters to Naomi uh, some famous words that we often use in weddings. I'm not sure why we use them in weddings because um, it's words that a daughter is saying to her mother-in-law. But Anyways, we we use them in weddings. In verse 16, Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Now, many Bible scholars believe that these two widows, Naomi and Ruth, had another problem. Both women were barren, unable to have a child of their own. So no hope of a child meant no hope for future, which is problem number eight. So Naomi and Ruth, they travel back to Naomi's hometown. They go back to Bethlehem. And it says there in verse 19, when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Mara means bitter. So Naomi, she's bitter with God, which then presents Ruth with another problem to deal with. Problem number nine. She's got a bitter mother-in-law of whom she's taken charge of, of taking care of. I mean, what do you say to her? Like, you know, God has a plan. I mean, she's already bitter. Toward God. What, what do you do f- with that? So here we are, chapter one alone. There are fewer than no, less than um, uh, nine problems, none of which, by the way, are Ruth's fault or, or really uh, we're not given any indication that it's anybody's fault. It's just a series of very unfortunate events. So just imagine if you're Ruth, like what do you do? You're a woman, you're a widow, you're barren, you're in a foreign land. Now you're responsible for taking care of a bitter old woman. What do you do when life's problems seem bigger than life itself? What do you do when you have problems? Well, you pray. 
You pray. That when you've had the wind knocked out of you, when you don't know like, where to turn or who to even turn to, the Bible says that we're to pray. So can I offer you just two very simple sentences maybe to pray when you have problems? Here's, here's something that you could pray. God, please hear my prayer. God, please hear my prayer. And throughout scripture, we see this prayer over and over. Um, We're not necessarily going to see it in the book of Ruth, but but we do see it in other places in scripture. Psalms, for example. Psalms is a a great place to go uh, where people are writing songs, um, but it's an expression of their emotions and their feelings. Uh, Whatever it is, they're pouring it out to God. And we see in Psalm 39, verse 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. Psalm 54, 2, O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to, my, to the words of my mouth. Psalm 102, verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. And sometimes I understand it feels like it's like you pray and you just feel like your prayer isn't going anywhere or like, like it's hitting the ceiling. So to start by just praying, God, hear my prayer, I think that's a great place to start. And, I, and I'm sure like somewhere along that 10-day journey from Moab to Bethlehem, as they kind of walked under the burden of their problems, I'm sure one, if not both, at some point in time prayed, God, please hear my prayer. Please see what's going on here in my life and listen. Now, here's the thing. Naomi knew something about her homeland that Ruth may not. Because remember, Ruth is a Moabite woman. And, and God had structured things there within Israel that Naomi, growing up in Israel, probably would have known about. So uh, God had structured the culture of Israel in such a way that if you planted a field, you were not allowed to harvest the outer edges of your field. You were to leave those edges unharvested and make them available to the foreigner, to the widow, to the orphan, and to the poor person so they could glean and be able to feed themselves and take care of themselves. It was a great, uh, merciful, gracious, kind law of God that he had established. And, And Naomi would have been aware of this law. And so Naomi instructs Ruth what to do in order to get food once they got into her homeland. And then she even instructs Ruth to go visit um, her late husband's relative, Boaz, to go to him first. So Ruth goes to one of Boaz's fields. And Boaz, he sees her and he begins to inquire, who who is this woman? And then notice in verse 8, Boaz of chapter 2, by the way, Ruth 2, verse 8, Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. This act of Boaz is an incredible act of grace. Boaz here, he didn't just simply fulfill what was required of him in the law. He, He went above and beyond. Now, Boaz, later in the book, he would be identified as um, being Ruth's kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer was just simply a a relative who was charged with the duty of restoring the rights and avenging the wrongs of another, of another kin, a relative. And so in many ways, what we see in scripture is that Boaz, um, he's kind of like a foreshadowing of Jesus, Jesus who is our redeemer. See, much like Boaz, who not only fulfilled the law, but, but after doing so, he, he offered amazing grace to, to Ruth to restore her and to redeem her from her dire situation. Well, that's what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. Jesus fulfilled the law and then it gave us amazing, overflowing, abundant grace to redeem us and to restore us back into a relationship with him. So with that in mind, notice how Ruth responds to Boaz's grace. Verse 10 of chapter 2. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. 
and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. See, Boaz, as a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, treats Ruth how we, as followers of Jesus Christ, ought to treat others, right? We're to treat others with this kindness and generosity and sacrifice, love. And we're to do so much more than just simply because Jesus said we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. Or, or just simply that we're to treat others as we would want them to treat us because that's what we ought to do. That's the good thing to do. You have to understand, love your neighbor as yourself flows out of a deep theological truth. Uh, John would tell us what that truth is in 1 John 4 verse 19. He would say it this way, we love because God first loved us. He then goes on to say, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You see, there's this thread that, that just kind of runs all throughout scripture. And, and this is the thread that we were created to be deeply and daily loved by God. Again, we see this starting off in Genesis chapter two. There you've got Adam and Eve, they're walking with God in the cool of the day. And they were created to be deeply and daily loved by God. Scripture then even tells us that that, that even after Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered into the equation, Scripture tells us that even in our rebellion, even in our acts of sin against God, God still loves us so much so that he would send his own son, Jesus Christ, who would die on a cross to redeem us and reconcile us back to him. See, you've got to understand that there is nothing that you could ever do that would cause God to love you less and there's nothing that you would ever done that has caused God to love you or would cause God to love you more. God's love for you has never nor will ever change for God never changes and God is love. And God loves you deeply and he loves you daily. And Satan is going to do everything he can to convince you otherwise. I mean, is that not what he did there in the Garden of Eden there with Eve in chapter 3? He goes to Eve and he says, did God really say that? Do you you really think that you can trust God? You know, if God loved you, he'd let you. But because he won't, then you know what? Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't love you. See, Satan's going to try and convince you that because of what you did, you shouldn't be loved by God. Or you can't be loved by God. or, Or you won't be loved by God. And the minute you believe this, the minute you believe this, you'll begin to seek to find your value elsewhere. You'll try to find your value in your appearance, in your looks, and how you come across to other people. You'll try to find your value in your associations and who you know or who you can gain the approval of. You'll try to find your value in your acquisitions, what you can buy, what you can own. You'll try to find your value in your achievements, what you can do or what you can accomplish or produce. And unfortunately, these four things become the foundation from which many seek love from others. But it's also the foundation that many give to a love to others as well. And when you and I, when we seek to place our value in such things instead of in God who loves us, either we're gonna to develop too high a view of ourselves or too low a view of ourselves, or we'll be too easy on other people or we'll be too hard on other people. And for Ruth on that day, in in response to Boaz's amazing offer of grace, Ruth simply responded, why have I found favor in your eyes that you would take notice of me? What she is saying is, is I've got none of those things that other people look for. I'm a barren widow. I'm a foreigner in a foreign land. I've got nothing of value to give to you. I have nothing of importance to even offer to you. And Ruth's response in so many ways, is that not the response that we ought to give toward God? God, why have you found favor? Why have you given grace to me? 
I have nothing of value to offer you. I'm in desperate need of you. Timothy Keller would put it this way. Don't let success go to your head and don't let failure go to your heart. And all too often, it's easy to tip one way or the other, isn't it? And the only way that we can prevent from doing so is by gaining and seeing ourselves through the lens of our Heavenly Father. We gotta be able to see ourselves as our Heavenly Father sees us, who, on the one hand, he knows all about us. He knows all of our faults and he knows that we've done some pretty ungreat things. And yet, at the same time, God loves us regardless. And you and I, we have got to believe this at the core of our soul so that when we pray, God, hear my prayer, please hear my prayer, you've got to know and believe that you are praying to a God who is loving, who is good, who is gracious and kind, one who loves you deeply and daily. Which then brings me to the second part of what we can pray when we have problems. It's not just simply, God, please hear my prayer, but it's, God, please help me. Again, all throughout Psalms, we see this repeated over and over again. For example, in Psalm 18, 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. Psalm 28, 2, hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward the most holy sanctuary. Psalm 79, 9, help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins, for your name's sake. But therein lies the struggle, doesn't it? Because I know, we've all prayed, God, please help me. And sometimes it just didn't seem like anything happened. So let's just kind of say for the sake of argument, let's just say if if you were to be given uh, this puzzle. Let's just say after service, everybody, uh, you know, we all gave you this puzzle. and And the challenge was, was to go home and to put this puzzle together by the end of the week. Except instead of giving you the box, I gave you this. And I just said, put the puzzle together. Now, for some of you, you'd probably be able to put, you know, chunks of it together but it would be a really frustrating experience. I mean, you'd, you'd be like, you know, where's the cover? Like, why can't I see the big picture here? I mean, if I could just see the big picture, I could understand where all these different pieces and parts, they come together. But because I don't see that, I'm frustrated and I'm, I'm really angry. Like, why won't you help me out if I could just simply see the bigger picture? And, and to a great degree, you know, this is one of the challenges of life, that when we face situations or, or problems that just seem to be out of our control and maybe even at times are out of our control, it's like we're looking at these fragmented pieces of our lives and we're not able to see the bigger picture and we think, you know, if I could just simply see the bigger picture of what's going on, then, well, then this would make better sense. And, and not only that, I'd, I'd probably feel better. But is that really true? I mean, would you feel better if you saw the bigger picture? Would Job have felt better? Would Job have felt better if, if he could understand the bigger picture of what was going on when, when everybody in his family except for his wife had died, when he lost all of his possessions all in one afternoon, and then he lost his health? Would he have felt better if he understood the bigger picture? Or, or maybe another way to ask the question, would seeing the bigger picture remove the grief of losing so much? I, I don't think it would really change much at all. So scripture tells us instead, when we can't see the bigger picture, we need to trust God who does. And I know this principle, by the way, this is really easy to say when life's good. But it's really hard to put into practice when life is not. As a matter of fact, uh, this principle can even come across as being uh, flippant or or dismissive of uh, people's concerns and struggles. But this principle, you have to understand when it is placed within the context of a God who deeply and daily loves you, well, then this principle is a lot easier to swallow, isn't it? 
So parents, can I, can I just express a concern that I have during this time that we kind of find ourselves in with coronavirus? Um, it was actually a concern that my wife brought up. We were having a conversation with uh, some friends of ours over Zoom uh, about a week ago, actually. And my wife made this observation, and I agree with her. I, I think that our kids who are aware of what's going on in the world, I, I'm concerned for them that, that this is going to be a generation that's going to grow up with tremendous anxiety and depression. I really believe that. Because, you know, when there's a, a loss of control and, and uh, there's just things are kind of falling apart again, people losing their jobs, and, you know, you think about these seniors who, uh, you know, are losing out on their senior year experiences of graduation, prom, and um, just the, the being away from friends, etc., all because of this, this virus that, that's just unknown and we don't know what to do with it yet. And I, I'm concerned that, that there's this anxiety that's going to be developing within our kids. And, and when there's this loss of control, it leads to fear and, and hopelessness, which then leads to depression. And I'm really concerned that, that we're going to have a generation of kids who are going to struggle with anxiety and with depression. And as parents, Christian parents, people who are followers of Christ, who are believers in God, we've got to be able to teach and to model for them what it means and what it looks like to trust God in the midst of this. That's not saying that that, you know, we're to hide these problems for them. I'm not saying that we're to fake it and say, oh, everything's okay and, you know, it's, it's gonna be fine. I think it's okay to, to express to your kids that, that yeah, we're concerned, but, but to then help them understand to see the problems within the context of a God who loves them deeply and daily, a God of whom we can trust. I think we have to do a good job during this time to teach and to show them what it looks to trust God through times like this. For Ruth, Life didn't turn out the way that she thought. But God had a bigger picture. He had a bigger plan of which Ruth was playing a vital part. Because over time, as Ruth continued to work in Boaz's fields, as Boaz continued to provide and protect Ruth, Boaz and Ruth would become husband and wife. And it says there in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, there at the very end of the book of Ruth, It says, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception. That phrase, by the way, is why many biblical scholars believe that Ruth up to this point was unfertile or infertile, uh, but the Lord uh, moved on her in her behalf. And so it says that the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse the father of David. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but at the very beginning of the book of Ruth, we're given a family tree. And for all intents and purposes, that family tree was, was dead. The patriarch was dead. And there was no male offspring. But then we come to the end of the book of Ruth and we're given another family tree. A family tree that would stretch on into eternity. For Boaz and Ruth would have a son named Obed. Obed would have a son named Jesse. Jesse would have a son named David. David would become the king of Israel through whom would come King Jesus who is sitting on his throne and whose reign is eternal. You see, God always, always, always works with the bigger picture in mind. And when you and I, when we have problems, the natural tendency for us is to ask the question like, why? Why did this happen? And there's nothing wrong with asking that question. It's just that we have to know that sometimes, if not most times, we're we're never going to understand or or be given an answer this side of heaven. And as a result, it kind of causes a lot of us to worry. 
Somebody once said, if you have time to worry, you've got time to pray. If you have time to worry, you have time to pray. We can pray, God, please hear my prayer. God, please help me. And every time that we pray such a prayer to God like this, God is going to point us into one of two places, if not both. God is going to direct us to his word where we can read the heart and the mind of God. But God will also direct us to his people, to his followers, so that we can experience the love of God with each other. When we pray and when we go to God's word, our attention is going to shift from the smaller problems of our lives to a bigger, grander, greater God who daily and deeply loves us. And when we pray and when we go to God's people, followers of Christ, the church, we're going to experience people who are seeking to love their neighbors well because they understand what it means to have problems. And they know how much they're deeply and daily loved by God themselves. And so therefore they love others in their problems, much in the same way as God has loved them in all of theirs. Simply put, they try to be like Jesus. And that last part, that idea of, of, of being able to go to God's people to, to experience the love of God, is that not the way it's supposed to be? Here at Grace, I, you know, we try, and I, I know we're not perfect, but, but I know we're trying to, to be like Jesus. This last week, for example, the, the elders, uh, your zone elder, uh, sent you an email if you're in our database, and and we just simply wanted to let you know that we're here for you, that we're praying for you. And if there's anything going on in your life that, that we can be praying about to reach out or if there's anything practical that we can do to help out, just to let us know. And, and, and I want you to know that, that they meant that, what they said in the email. So, so don't hesitate to ask. We, we want to be here to pray with you and we want to be able to do whatever we can to help. And that's what it means to be the body of Christ together. So the conclusion, the story of Ruth tells us that in your problems, don't give up on God, don't give up on each other, don't give up on yourself. Instead, pray. Pray, God, please hear my prayer. God, please help me. And then go to God's word for assurance and for confidence and go to God's people for encouragement and support. All the while trusting. Trusting God who deeply and daily loves you who has heard your prayer, sees the bigger picture, and who is at work doing something for his glory and for your good. My name is Melissa, and this is Mitchell, my husband. And we have been here at Grace for a little over two years. Um, we moved to Lavernia about three years ago and quickly found Grace as our home. And about a year ago, I guess it'll be a year, the end of May, Mitchell found himself uh, without a job and immediately pushed us into a place of trust. Um, are we gonna trust ourselves? Are we gonna trust God? Um, where is our, our trust going to lie? And where is our faith going to lie? Being out of a job was by choice. Um, my father was uh, terminally ill and uh, and just through the circumstances that were going on at work and with my father falling terminally ill um, I thought it was best that I leave uh, tenure or resignation um, however we were thinking it would be maybe a couple of months of being out of work um, that couple of months, however, turned into a much longer period, uh, nine to ten months. And through that nine to ten months of unemployment, um, it stretched us. I remember a phone call from a good friend of mine. I said, hey, I've got a word for you from God. And he said, uh, I've got to break you, my son. Our kids, our kids uh, felt a lot of the pressure.
Melissa would pray with them on the way to school and they would, the kids themselves would pray that daddy gets a job, that dad, God give daddy a job today, one that'll be good and for him and for our family that, that uh, we won't have to be stressed anymore. Um, you really know when they're worrying when your 13 year old is uh, on LinkedIn and on Indeed. doing job searches and matching your ID up to jobs and sending them to you. It hits home. And maybe that was my breaking point that my friend was talking about because I'd finally come to the resolve and I was out in my yard Melissa said, let's put the fertilizer out in the yard and straighten the grass up and everything. Because um, we had talked about putting the house on the market and having to sell it. Um, so that's where my mind was at. And so I went out and got fertilizer and I was out there on the lawnmower dragging the fertilizer bucket around, fertilizing the grass. Um, when I got the offer that I'm at the position that I'm in now. But I, just, I was on that mower, mentally preparing to sell my home, which I thought for sure, without a doubt, two years ago, that God put us there, that God put us in this church with these people in this community. And I was questioning, I was like, wow, this is a tough pill to swallow because either it's right or it's wrong. And right now it feels really wrong because I feel like we're supposed to be here. It hasn't changed, but yet I'm making preparations to, to leave where I think I'm supposed to be. And lo and behold, it was less than 24 hours later, I was signing documents and stuff with for a job. That was my breaking point. That was knowing that my circumstances rely some total faith, total commitment without understanding. Um, being able to support a husband who at, at times was struggling. Um, to support my kids who at times were struggling or feeling scared, um, I knew it was critical. And I knew that meant me finding resources for our family, whether that be counseling, whether that be um, reading scripture and passing that on to them, prayer, obviously, and then just reaching out to people that we knew loved and supported us. Um, there's no harm at all in asking people for help. Um, whether that's, you know, people that you're super close with, people that you know love you um, and support you. And we found all of that here with our church family. We obviously found it with our, our biological and, you know, extended family as well. But the day in and day out of, um, I'm having a crummy day, you know, this bill's coming due, the kids are struggling, um, Mitchell's dad did pass away while we were going through all of this, so the, the grief um, and dealing with all that, just knowing that we had that support was critical and we had the resources we needed um, to support our family as well, um, to show them the faithfulness, but that they don't have to do it on their own. I think that's critical. People think that when they're going through a hard time, it's, I got to pull my bootstraps up on my own and do this on my own and not let people know I'm having a hard time. When your hard time is gonna be 10 times harder when you don't have someone to shoulder that burden with you. Um, whether that was a hug, someone just stopping and saying, hey, let's pray. Um, I'm praying for you, love you. Here's a gift card, was thinking about you today, a text. All of those things poured into us as we went through this desert. Those were the blooms that we saw throughout the desert. Um, and 
knowing that that was there, but knowing even with that love, how much greater God's love is for us and knowing that he wants what's best for us. What did we learn through this? You know, what are, what are we gonna learn from this? That's one of the major things for me. I know God's faithful. We've been through hard times before. This was not the first hard time we've ever seen in our marriage and parenting. Um, but every time we've seen his faithfulness and to be able to cling to that. And again, like he said, our kids are old enough to see what we've gone through, to know the heaviness of it, um, but then to see God provide, to see his faithfulness in action in their lives firsthand um, as it was going to detrimentally affect them at some point if, if something didn't change. So I think the resources that were provided in the desert, the oasis we would see here and there was what got us through a lot of it. Lord Jesus, you made a way for us.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Sing it out. Even when I don't see it, you Yeah, you are. 